Good afternoon, everyone. This is Edward Jones, Director of Programs for APSI, a Philanthropic Partnership for the Black Communities. And on behalf of APSI and our Board of Directors and members, I'd like to invite you or thank you for joining us in our first third Thursday for 2015. It's a series that we really got off and started last year, and we're continuing the series by having a lot of a timely and provocative conversations around the field of philanthropy. And in that space, we just appreciate your being here. It's going to be a lively conversation. If you've been on the web or you saw some material that we've sent out, you'll see who's speaking with us today. And so we just want to invite you to sit back. I enjoy the experience. I'll go to the next slide. And then also we invite you to join the conversation. We have a few places that we want folks to just join us via, via the world of social media. Uh, use the hashtag Dear Philanthropy uh, as a tool for that. Um, we will we'll have a series of presentations. We will have a time for questions and answers, but we also want to invite you to join the conversation as a, along the way. And to start us off, this particular conversation uh, was created not just with a random thought, but it really came about in response to uh, an experience that one of our members and partners at Jonathan Cooper happened to see in an article on Wall Street via the Wall Street Journal. And in that particular article, there was a discussion or an image around millennials and philanthropy that just did not reflect what we know. So. Through that conversation, it created this uh, need for us to create the webinar, Dear Philanthropy, a Necessary Conversation on Millennial Diversity Within the Sector. And to that end, we want to talk a little bit about how that came to be. So actually, another partner in this discussion, Jalisa Whitney, is going to actually um, talk on behalf of Ebony and talk a little bit about the experience. And so there was an image that was shown that was on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And in this conversation about millennials, what was missing, and it was a diverse space. Um, the diversity that was that should have been there was not there. And that struck a chord with Ebony and Jalisa. Uh, I believe Ebony is actually on the call now. And so um, Ebony and Jalisa, both of you can share with us. You saw this image when you saw the Wall Street Journal, and you saw this notion that this was a conversation around diversity, uh, around millennials, an idea uh, that emerged in your eyes, but it did not reflect you in the network of givers that you all are part of. So talk a little bit about that. What did it prompt you to do, and how did you respond? Hi, this is Julie, so I'm not sure if Ebony can jump on yet. but. Um yeah, Edward, as, we, as you were saying, we saw this Wall Street Journal article that spoke about millennial giving and the importance of it, but there was no imagery of millennials of color, and we thought that lack of diversity was important because when that research is out there, it, it talks about what millennials are important to be engaged, and we thought it was important to increase awareness of the presence of black and other minority millennial giving for a variety of reasons, including um, the importance of um, minority millennial giving as far as addressing community-based problems, um, talking about the diversity of impact and fundraising, that there needs to be targeted fundraising to these group of individuals because we do give and we are out there, and also the importance of diversity within leadership in nonprofits and foundations, and also the diversity of volunteers, that we're a big portion of those individuals who are giving our time and talents in the communities. And we need to also be reflected in this imagery of why it's important to engage millennials. And so what we decided to do was write an op-ed and response that really talked about um, young black and giving back and how we are here and we are making an impact and to outline some of the ways that nonprofits and foundations should engage us as well as important stakeholders in this conversation. So what Friends of Ebony does is really galvanize young black professionals to help shape the audience into trailblazing leaders and build the bridge to sustainable engagement relationships for nonprofit organizations and foundations. So we really think that diversity isn't just a buzzword, it's the real world, and black millennials are involved in community work, 
and are equipped with the hearts and desires to make it as, um, a difference. We really want it to put an alternative image of what millennial giving really looks like. Gotcha. No, there's, there's no question. Actually, you see the next slide, it kind of gives a sense of where we are as a society. Actually, this is from from 2009 um, through uh, the Pew Research Center, and it kind of shows the, the, the diversity of the millennial community um, and millennials in America um, as part of the overall population. Um, so this is a really important piece as we think about that. Um, so in that space of the need of diversity, the need to be mindful of who's out there, one important entity in the philanthropic community has been community foundations. And last year, they celebrated their centennial. Uh, 40th anniversary. Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you know, that's okay, because you guys celebrated an anniversary, too. So we have with us Angela Jones-Hackley, who's the interim president and vice president of the Philanthropic Services for the Community Foundation for the National Capital Region, which actually uh, covers D.C. and parts of Maryland and Virginia. And they, too, celebrated an anniversary. And in, in this anniversary uh, era, community foundations have been talking a lot about what's next for them and how it show how they show up because when they were founded the, the, the diversity of the space was not uh, a, a it was it just was not existent basically there were a lot of white males who were driving it. a lot of the white um, leadership was driving the, the, the space of philanthropy but now we know that these are changing and so Angela could you talk a little bit about how you all see that community foundation, which is representing a region that is definitely quite diverse and growing increasingly more diverse. Yeah, I mean, so so let me say that, I mean, I agree with you, um, um, just to put out there, that I think the lack of diversity in philanthropy in general is not um, unique to what's happening with millennials. I would, I would, you know, say that from my experience, having been in this work and in this field, in the nonprofit sector for well over 25 years, but in the philanthropic sector for now about eight years, there are not very many people that look like me or other persons of color in the field in general and not necessarily in the community foundation field. I think that I mean, our staff is probably well over 60% um, um, minority, some of that because of the diversity of the region um, and some of that because of just who we are as a foundation and our commitment to diversity and diverse ideas, not just what people look like, but diversity as a whole. Um, last year, when we began our strategic planning work, we set five key priorities. And one of those priorities was really to begin to focus on um, increasing our reach and being deliberate about our presence and working with millennials um, in, in, in terms of um, moving philanthropy. Inherent in that is obviously our commitment to making sure that there's some you know, diversity in the space, although the, the goal itself is not uniquely um, just focused on, on millennials, I mean on di um, diverse millennials. We um, began that work last year um, with some partnership with a, a local, some local efforts called the Invest Foundation. Um, and are going to be really mapping out a larger plan this year. And so um, it is our hope that by the end of this fiscal year, and our fiscal year is a little interesting, our new fiscal year begins in April, so that be beginning in April we'll have really a more deliberate plan that, that really takes a look at how do we address um, engaging more millennials in our, in our work of community philanthropy as well as engaging more, uh, a more diverse population than we, than we have in the past in that space. You've got the slide up that shows sort of the history of what our grant making has looked like in the D.C. region. Um, and we are now currently the largest uh, grant tour in the region, although the majority of those monies that go out the door, um, 34 million or so that went out last year, are, you know, go out on behalf of our donors um, and not necessarily discretionary dollars. So. Um, that just sort of gives you a sense of where we are. We are certainly prioritizing it. Prioritizing it is a part of our strategic plan. It is one of our five key priorities, and um, we certainly welcome any advice um, for those folks that are, are working in the D.C. area um, in helping us kind of map out that plan. We have um, we have two folks on our staff who are millennials themselves, 
um, who are leading that work uh, and doing um, the planning for us. Well, thank you for bringing that up and for that overview, Angela, actually, because a lot of times, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, hear a little bit more about it, actually, when Brixton uh, discusses some of it. But when you all are at the table with your staff and team talking about about the lack of diversity, are you are you finding any pushback in perception when it comes from you know, either in in your space amongst your your your, your colleagues and staff, um, and, or in the space of donors or donor prospects? Do you, do you see that there are some people that just aren't still not fully understanding the need to be thoughtful around what does the next century look like? Um, I think that we all know that that um, you know we. We, the conversations are necessary. We see the shifts and changes. We see the importance of it. You know, sir, our donor base now is not, rel is not rel really diverse. I mean, as a region, I think we have struggled with um, having diverse, a diverse donor base in general, not just, again, amongst millennials. You know, certainly there's a good amount of giving, for example, in Prince George's County, but that is primarily through to the faith community, not necessarily through the community foundation. And so I'm working also with a group of um, uh, Asian philanthropists in Northern Virginia to try to sort of get at how do we increase the face of Asian philanthropy in the region as well. And, and so the, the conversation is certainly happening. I think people are supportive, open to it, and so it gives me some promise that that there is a deliberate attempt at least to have the conversation on our part and that people are receptive to it because we certainly understand that philanthropy is not the kind of thing, it's not one size fit all. It doesn't look the same way, and it shouldn't look the same way for everyone in every community. And we just have to figure out, uh, you know, how we address it in different communities where we need to. Sure, sure. Um, but before we go to Charles, uh, I'm going to ask one other question, but I'll also remind the audience, if you have questions that you'd like to pose uh, when we get to the questions and answer period, Please use the chat um, box on your right and fill in the question, and we'll make sure we get to as many of those as possible. We'll get to the Q and A. And as I said before, we get to Charles, who's going to come from a different perspective of giving. I wanted to acknowledge the, the appreciation for Community Foundation and supporting the Black Benefactors, which is a Black-led giving circle that's in the D.C. region that was created. Um, now seven years ago with the express intent of using and leveraging small dollars to really help make impact in organizations that are largely serving black organizations in need in the community. And so how do you see the giving circle piece? Because I know there are also other identity-based giving circles in the area like the Cherry Blossom Fund in D.C., the Masala, there's some other groups that are doing that work. How do you see the Community Foundation's relationship with these giving circles being another way of catalyzing new relationships? I mean, I think giving circles are important because it allows um, entree into the space without having sort of high dollar value. So for example, our fund minimum um, to start giving is $10,000. And you know, if you are a young person just starting out in your career or you don't have the resources yet. Yet, I mean, I believe anybody can be a philanthropist. It doesn't mean you have to be, you know, sort of the the, the wealth of a Bill Gates or or you know any of those folks to, to to begin to give back. And giving circles are a really good way to do that. To um, you know, be with like-minded people and and to give at the level that you're comfortable with giving at, but still make an impact. And so collectively, you're making an impact that's larger than what you might be able to make on your own. And so we believe in supporting all kinds of giving circles, specifically when they're focused in a way, either on a population or uh, as a way of engaging more people into the space. Because the more people that we have in the space, the the larger impact we are collectively able to have um, on our community. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so, moving on, uh, we invite you or introduce you to Charles Lewis, who is um, from down in Birmingham and brings a couple perspectives. There's the, co the corporate perspective of your work, but then also, Charles, you do bring in this conversation specifically around a uh, giving circle that you co-founded in Birmingham. So, thanks for joining us, Charles. 
so talk to us a little bit about your views on this space because this is how you come into the, the period of giving. And when you when you gave, when you came in, you were definitely in the millennial space, and you say you're kind of on the borderline now. So <laughs> talk to us, Charles. That's right. So um, you know, I, I appreciate being a part of this uh, conversation today. It's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I bring you greetings from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, if you've never been to the South, I really would love for any of the folks that are participating on this uh, call to come to the South and uh, and give me a call. I'd love to show you around our dear city. Um, the backdrop I would like to start off by uh, mentioning to you guys is exactly what uh, Mr. Jones just said, and that is I was pleasantly reminded about a week ago, uh, I was talking to one of my friends and they, and uh, I said, well, hey, I'm about to be a part of a conversation about millennials. And uh, that particular friend kindly reminded me that I actually was not a part of the millennial generation. And so I had to go back up and, uh, and do a little research. So I'm a couple of years out of the millennial uh, generation. Uh, but, you know, as the presentation says, I tend to say I'm on the cusp of, of the millennial generation, and also I have millennial tendencies, so uh, bear with me. The other thing I'd like to give you a little context about who's speaking and, and over these next couple of slides, you know, I come from the perspective of my educational background, that is, as an engineer and undergrad. And so two things, if, if I don't speak in a... Um, not-for-profit lingo, um, just understand I'm, I'm coming to you more from a layman's uh, perspective. And from my perspective, it's uh, getting a systematic, um, a systematic approaches to changing our world. And so if we go to the next slide, I'd like to talk to you about and paint a picture for you about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, I'm a young young earth engineer uh, with my own ideas about um, how I can be a part of making this city uh, Birmingham a better place and, and, and in my own right how to make um, the world a better place and so I got exposed to through uh, some uh, interaction I got exposed to this concept. It was new to me and that was of organized philanthropy. Uh, didn't have kind of the background of organized philanthropy, so that's kind of where I came from. Um, and so shortly thereafter, uh, pulled friends together, uh, most of which were engineers, and we realized we had some fundamental truths. And some of those fundamental truths uh, tended to be the three things listed on this, on this, on this presentation. One, we realized that we had more power, especially then, um, collectively, uh, when we pooled our resources together. Um, so when you start talking about, you know, none of the folks that were around the table here in Birmingham that started this Birmingham Change Fund at the time, uh, to my knowledge, were millionaires. But we realized uh, as if we pooled our resources together, we could make an impact on some of the things that were going on in our city. The second thing, we, we all had this, this idea and this understanding that it was better, better to, to have team accomplishment than, rather than uh, individual accomplishment. And so there was a uh, submitting to the group uh, effort to, to help change uh, Birmingham outside of outside of uh, individuals uh, and individual egos. So I, I have to put my hats off to uh, the founders, uh, the other original founders of the Birmingham Change Fund and those that, that have joined. So the Birmingham Change Fund started a giving circle. I didn't say that, but that's what the Birmingham Change Fund is. And some 10 years later, we're still going strong. The last thing I'll talk about on this slide is, you know, we realized, and it was very, uh, we were very cognizant at, at that time, most of which we were in our 20s and early 30s at the time. We realized that um, what we were collectively worth, if you were to put it into a, a, a net present, well, if you were to put it into a present value of 
monetary, monetary resources at the time, financial resources, wasn't where we were going to end up, say, 10 years later. And so um, we realized that at the time, if folks were to look at us, we weren't uh, collectively uh, pooling the same type of money as, as, as a more wealthy uh, uh, philanthropist or, or um, giver. But we would all be uh, blessed and, and, and have more resources in the future. So we can go to the next slide. Those were the fundamental truths. Some of the things we intentionally set out to do as we uh, 21 individuals came together for the Birmingham Change Fund to start the Birmingham Change Fund, we, we realized uh, and, and heard rumors in organized philanthropy 10 years ago, which is very similar to the conversation we're having today. Um, I particularly heard, as I did research around, um, I heard the, the notion that, hey, we can't find diverse candidates to sit on boards. We can't find diverse candidates to give to the community foundation. They just aren't out there. Uh, that was the conversations I heard. We intentionally set out to provide a new pool of leadership, resources, and talent uh, to kind of debunk that uh, in incorrect statement uh, that was kind of going around, uh, I believe, as, as far as I can tell, across the country. Um, we wanted to be intentional about influencing the narrative. And so there's this notion of sitting at the table or getting to the table. We want to not only get to the table, we want to influence the conversation once we get to the table. And so keeping in, in mind uh, the, the truths that we had, we held amongst ourselves, we knew that uh, whether it was 10 years ago or whether it was now, we were going to uh, make intentional impact on getting to the table and influencing uh, conversations towards the things that we saw um, could help change our community. We, we, we took it very serious also that we wanted to develop ourselves to take the baton of leadership um, in some future um, time. And so leadership corporately and also uh, on the not-for-profit side. Uh, Birmingham is a very uh, giving city um, compared, comparatively to some other um, places, and the, the structure, the social structure, the not-for-profit side, uh, corporate leadership and uh, philanthropic leadership in, in our um, region really kind of merges a, as one. We also, just frankly, in the name, the Birmingham Change Fund, we wanted to change Birmingham, and of course for the better, not only for um, African Americans here in the, in the city of Birmingham, but also for uh, the whole city. And so we chose organized philanthropy as our vehicle and a giving circle in particular. Uh, at this point, I, I would like to add one other thing before we go to the next slide, and that is Birmingham Change Fund uh, did not start in, a, in, in kind of a microcosm. There, there were uh, other uh, giving circles similar to the Birmingham Change Fund started through the Community Investment Network around the same time. And so at, uh, at present, the Community Investment Network has about uh, 15 giving circles in and around the nation similar to the Birmingham Change Fund currently. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So what have we done? I, I, I'd like to speak a little bit about, you know, we, we intentionally set out to sit at the table, um, change the narrative and also be ready to take leadership positions. So since then, in 10 years, if you look back, several of the folks that started the Birmingham Change Fund have sat on not-for-profit not boards um, in leadership roles. Um, we have elected officials who have taken up the leadership baton, folks that have, are sitting on. Uh, we have two sitting uh, Birmingham Change Fund members that is sitting on the uh, Birmingham City School uh, Board of Education board. And so, you know, we, we have other uh, folks that have aspirations and have, you know, taken up other leadership uh, 
roles around our community. And we have become a part of the fabric of, of change in our city. And we were intentional about that 10 years ago. When you look back 10 years later, here in the present, I think we've, 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 we've gotten there. Um, there's a lot more to come. And so what I would, uh, I always tell folks, uh, watch out, not, not for where we are right now, but where we will be in the future. And so uh, we can go to the next slide. There's, two, there's a couple of takeaways I'd like to leave folks with. Um, one, you know, the model of which, uh, if you study the Birmingham Change Fund and other circles similar to Birmingham Change Fund, you know, to me, it's a, it's a matter of starting where you are and um, letting your results be heard. And so that's, that's what we have to do, I think, and, and that's what we, we've tried to do. I think we, we, we are um, getting closer and closer to that. Um, we took time to go back and study. Most of us, again, were not involved in the not-for-profit sector, and so we had to go back and try to learn from the past. Uh, other movements about how to effectively um, interact or change, and we move forward in that way. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to bring up, uh, we talk about not-for-profit leadership, and what I would urge everyone on the call to do is to continue to take up the mantle of social entrepreneurship. I would be remiss if I did not speak about the very large logo you see um, in the middle of the page, which is A.G. Gaston, construction, and uh, guys, can you hold for just We may have been for a hold a second. Let me, let me just appreciate what what was just said um, by Charles in a few ways. First of all, if you ever have a chance to visit Birmingham, if you've not done so, please do so. I recommend it. Uh, AFDI's uh, Connecting Leaders Fellowship Program spent a week in Birmingham during the week of the elections last year, and it was a, an eye-opening experience. For those of you that have seen or have not seen Selma, um, the movie Selma opened and in a powerful way and it takes you right back to Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham is a rich history and it's definitely something worth exploring and experiencing. And so since Charles did extend the invitation to reach out, then I suggest you do so. The folks of the Change Fund, they were gracious hosts to all of us and the city just has so much going on uh, as far as history as well as as far as future. There's a lot of great work going on in the, um, in the space of future. Uh, in, in, I should say the space of future development of future um, opportunities. I should also mention uh, in Charles's comments around the idea of sitting on boards and gaining that kind of presence. Uh, AFIS does this work around what we call leverage of the trust. And so when you're on a foundation board or a nonprofit board, you're influencing change. You're influencing where dollars go and, and issues are addressed. It's a very powerful place to be. A lot of organizations are looking to identify millennials and looking for young people uh, and, and and some are really intentional around even identifying the diverse voice at the table, be it um, gender diversity or um, ethnic racial diversity. So it's a good time to start thinking about how you show up. Uh, he also mentioned this notion of the Community Investment Network, which, as we mentioned, has about 15 or so funds uh, that are around the country. If you are in a city and you don't know if there's a community uh, giving circle in your in your space, then Community Investment Network can be a guide for you to help find that out and find out who's there. So go to and look up Community Investment Network. Uh, they have annual conference. They are, they are definitely a growing network of folks that are in this space of giving because we do know collectively we can make a big difference, even as Angela mentioned a little bit ago. You know, we don't, everyone doesn't have Bill and Melinda Gates money or Oprah money, but we can definitely make um, significant impact with the resources that we have before us. Uh, so I just want to mention those items. Uh, and so with that in mind, one of the strategies that we talk about is around, well, then if you don't have those dollars today, how might you get those dollars tomorrow? And so Bricks and Diamond, who is with us from the Executive Leadership Council, as well as, and I should just note, 
because of the idea that the Oscars just came out, and there's already a, a hashtag that's circulating about the lack of diversity in the Oscar space. Um, Brickson was one of the founders of Black House, uh, blackhousefoundation.org, which is a space that has been working to make sure that there's more diversity in, in Hollywood and in the, the film sector. But Brickson has some really great strategies um, as, a, as a philanthropist, as an executive, and a long-term uh, leader in so many different spaces. Uh, Brickson, talk to us a little bit about what you offer, what, how you might suggest some uh, folks start thinking about what their philanthropic influence will be in the future. Thank you, Edward. Uh, happy to be with you all today. Uh, as a starting point, I would just add a, a, a one biographical addition. Uh, is that I spent 15 years in the asset management business on the client relations and marketing side. And specifically, I worked with wealthy families uh, and individuals uh, stewarding their wealth. And so my perspective comes from advising them and supporting them, uh, but also from observing them uh, and understanding how we can show up in a room uh, in ways that are different and more powerful than we may even suspect. So if we go on to the first slide, you'll be able to get a perspective uh, of something that is really typically um, prescribed as the provenance of, of the wealthy, planned giving. So planned giving is mostly about wills, estates, and, and, and leaving behind um, typically what vast quantities of wealth. Uh, but if you push the slide once, you'll see there's another concept there uh, that's important to think about. And I actually learned about this uh, at a uh, Harvard University uh, planned giving dinner. Uh, I was one of the younger people in the room. I was one of the more brown people in the room. Uh, but this idea was really unique. Uh, at one university, uh, the development officer went to his senior class and said, I want each of you to set up an IRA uh, with the university named as a beneficiary. Uh, so this was to his larger givers. So $400, $500 is what he was asking for. And he said, if you put that money in and just name us as a, as a beneficiary and leave it alone, over your lifetime and when you are uh, deceased, a significant gift will be made to the university in your name. And that gives you entree for a relatively small price, uh, and you can do this over time, to a university that has a lasting impact. And also puts you into this category of givers. So suddenly you find yourself with a, a group of peers who perhaps have bigger uh, bequests to leave into the university, but you are now all of a sudden a person of color in your, uh, in your youth, uh, in their ranks. These people have jobs, and we've already established they have money. Uh, so you can uh, take a little clue here. You'll see that I'm thinking about you know, the mutual benefit of giving. If you go to the next page, uh, please. Uh, it, this is uh, just a cartoon that I think is, is, is pretty great in thinking about uh, the, the notion of tithing and, and how we can adjust uh, the uh, sometimes uncomfortable moniker of philanthropists to be more comfortable for, for those of us who are either in the millennial stage or, and or uh, people of color. Uh, so if you are from a, a traditional Christian background, you are well familiar with the sense of tithing, giving 10% of your income to the church. Uh, there's a notion, though, that you can give 10% overall, not just to the church, but to philanthropic and, and social good. Uh, and so this is a, a throwback to the church. You know, next time when I preach on tithing, don't sing Jesus paid it all as our invitational hymn. Uh, but again, if you think about tithing, that's a way to designate how much of your income are you setting aside uh, for, for, for gifting. Uh, and you can keep that number steady at 10% and increase your impact as your income increases. If we move to the next slide, you'll think about, and then we need to push one more time there, uh, you know, are you giving 10% of your income to charity? Next button. Do you have a priority list of the charities? So it's not just a matter of giving. Uh, so you've heard about giving circles. You've heard about community foundations. Uh, before you enter into either of those, you need to have an understanding of what your priorities are uh, because that will uh, inspire you to give more consistently and also to give more broadly. Next, please. How comfortable are you diming out your friends, right? So part of the game of, of giving is the ability to expand your gift by bringing in others. So if they see your passion, they will want some of that. And helping them to understand what you're learning. So that's your personal network. That's your professional network. 
uh, back in the day, I'm sure a lot of us sent our poor parents into the office with those candy bars, is that sort of concept. Uh, and then it's the philanthropic network. And I've got to tell you this last one is critically important. Because as you join giving circles, as you invest in community foundations, as you give more, you will find yourself in a circle of people who are inspiring uh, and who are traversing paths that you want to traverse and who can not only give you advice but give you a hand up. Uh, and so I think that has been critical in my career in terms of the engagement benefit that I got from donating uh, in, in a way that was significant in terms of my uh, either income or net worth. The other thing is thinking about how do you expand this notion of time, talent, and treasure. So those are the typical three measures you think about in the philanthropic world. You can volunteer giving your time. Uh, you can lend your talents by, if you're an accountant, expressing sort of the accountant uh, investment and so you can do the books for the organization, or you can give them money. There's a math problem though I think about, and that's this number, two times two times two times two equals what? The answer is 16. Uh, but expressed mathematically, that is 2 raised to the power of 4. And so what you think about in the next uh, push of the button will give you magically uh, one more push, this exponent. Uh, and so it's in math, it's when a number is multiplied by itself a number of times. Uh, so Charles may appreciate this as an engineer, but going forward one more, one more push of the button, uh, you'll see that in the, in the notion of philanthropy, it's when your giving is multiplied by itself because of your unique demographic attributes. So those of us on this call are already unique, people of color who are making contributions. Uh, and, and so when you make a financial contribution, you're able to get your seat at the table. And when you arrive at that table, you look different. I'll tell a story here. Uh, I went to Brown University undergraduate, and I have been a, a diligent giver to Brown every year, including my senior year. Uh, and what has happened is, because of my contribution of time and talent, when I gave treasure, they would really elevate me to groups that were beyond what I was giving. Uh, and so I was able to be exposed to people one, two, or three times uh, the giving level that I was. Uh, and what this meant at, the, at the, the best moment was that I ended up being in a room with the chairman of my $1 trillion firm with other major givers. Now, he had a vague sense of what I made, and he knew it wasn't even a fraction of what he made, but he also now had a sense that I was a hitter in this universe that he had a value in and that he valued being a part of. And, and so that piece, you know, again, it's about scale, but at the price of the table, the price of the vote, the table stakes, is putting money in, but the beauty is that your money as millennials has more power because of this exponential impact. On to the next slide, uh, we can think as well, uh, the button, you know, your insight, I'm sorry, let's go back one. Uh, it's also about your insight though, because of your, your demographic uh, perspective. You know, millennials are just all the rage, uh, and I'm sure you're not surprised and wonder why I was. Uh, but, you know, I do a lot of work with CEOs. The Executive Leadership Council is a member association of black CEOs and senior executives in Fortune 1000 companies. And I can tell you the thing that's most significant on the minds of CEOs today in Fortune 500 and 1000 companies is how they're going to attract you, how they're going to retain you, and how they're going to propel you forward in the organization such that when they are no longer around, it exists at its very core that it has customers, that it has workers, and that it has success. And so bringing your perspective to nonprofits is incredibly valuable because everyone is buzzing about how you're different and how they can access you. And so when you contribute time and a meaningful gift, you get a voice. Next page, finally. Uh, this is you know, all about who you know and who you know right now. So let's say you like to golf or play softball or play soccer or, or, or play kickball. Uh, those are associations that you have, and you can bring to bear uh, philanthropic mission and impact from those groups. Let's say you're part of Divine Nine. You can really work already in the service capacity of your organization to propel and to really expand the impact of the giving, uh, not just into the circles that may be traditional, but beyond other areas that create greater influence in your community. Uh, these are other associations. Uh, that are just examples and connectivity points 
that have real power and leverage. Next slide. You know, and that's that's really what it's about. Maintain your leverage, push some of the button if you would, uh, and understanding, you know, how do you own it? How do you leverage? What's the base of your power? Next slide as well, please. Ready for questions, I think, unless there are other folks to talk before me. Edward. No, um, actually, thank you so much for that, Brickson. Uh, I mean, I'm appreciating how we're all, all these conversations are really hopefully flowing. I know there's a lot of conversation on the hashtag Dear Philanthropy. Uh, just so you all know, we were going to use Dear White People, but that has been taken. So uh, Dear Philanthropy is a space where we really want to keep this conversation alive. And I know I had several questions, but I know, too, there are a number of questions in the queue. So let's get to the questions that are in the queue first. Um, Bianca, can you go with the first question and to whom it's posed? Um, hello, everyone. My, uh, I'm Bianca. I also work with AppFi. And uh, the first question isn't posed to anyone particularly, so any of the uh, panelists can feel free to uh, answer. But the first question is, is it more beneficial to a community to be a person of color in a traditional white philanthropic giving circle or to be a person of color in a giving circle by other people of color and still impacting the community? Great question. Anyone want to tackle that? I know I have this is Brixton. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, and, and I'll expand the, the, the base of that in terms of, you know, I work with um, Friends of Ebony on a, on a panel uh, a few months ago, and all of us on the panel who were consider ourselves philanthropists and community engaged folks in terms of nonprofit board leadership were working on white organizations, and our, our, our consensus was that we were helping to expand diversity. Uh, but I posed the question and challenged the group, you know, and myself included, what about the black organizations? And so I think it really is about where you have the most passion, right? And so if you, if you really feel like you have enough passion to be maybe a single voice in a broader conversation, then I would say perhaps a white giving circle is a great place for you. If, however, you aren't really ready to do that work, and the work you want to do is around impacting your community directly, then perhaps a, a black giving circle is best for you. But it really is about your, your perspective and your appetite relative to the kind of work you're ready to do. No, it's a great, great point. Did anyone else want to comment on that? Because I, I will just say, um, you know, being part of uh, the Giving Circle that is uh, largely black, and we actually have, we, we are diverse in a way. We, we do have a, at least one white member that I'm, I know of. It's interesting to be in that space and understand what it means to give uh, I give amongst peers, and it's not a matter of segregation. It's really a matter, I think, right to your point, Bricks, and the idea of passion. Because oftentimes what we've seen with that Appy, and we, we did a report a few months ago uh, last year called the Exit Interview, where there were African Americans that are working in uh, largely white institutions that didn't feel they had a voice, which was part of their frustration. And, I, and part of what happened when black benefactors, the D.C. area giving circle came about was, there was a number of black professionals that were working in philanthropy that were giving away money that was not uh, generated by uh, black people in all, and in a lot of ways people of color at all. So the giving circle became that vehicle to delve deeper and feel that you were having a greater impact. Although one, the, the, the actual day job helped give you the resource to create that giving experience, there was definitely a way to, to, to gain a greater appreciation for the space and the work by being in an entity like a giving circle. So I'd say get involved in the giving circle would be a great guide and whatever works there and what you can learn from there that can help the place that you have a passion for, all the better. Hi, hi Ed. This is Angela. I mean, I would add that I, I'm in both spaces as well. I'm, um, um, I belong to a bunch of, a bunch of different <laughs> affinity groups within philanthropy, but I think, um, and I, I would also agree that give where your passion is, but I think one of the real important things about being a diverse, being a, a minority, if you will, amongst the majority, is that at least I know from my perspective, when I'm in conversation about some of the grants that we're making, my experience 
um, most of the time is that I'm closer to the issue area that we're funding than many of my white counterparts. So for example, I have people in my family, I have people who are friends who have been, you know, who are basically close to some of the issues, and so I've got a different sense of what that investment means. And it's not mm -hmm. just free. And so I think and I'm not suggesting that all, you know, all folks who are African American or, you know, diverse have that close to the ground experience, but I'm just saying from my own experience that my that that experience brings a different outcome often to the conversation. That is not about the theory of philanthropy, but my on the ground real knowledge of what happens in community and what investments really mean. So I think that that's important too, that you, you do kind of have to be in that majority space because it changes the mindset of, of you know, some of what we're doing in philanthropy. Very good point, very good point. Thank you. Um, next question, Bianca. This next question is coming from an, an individual who works in Silicon Valley, and her question is, how do I help my company, um, the company that I work for and the nonprofit that I also work with, uh, help find the inclusion that we so historically lack in Silicon Valley, including m millennials, other people of color? Where do I even begin? So I would just offer that she's not sort of contacted Emmett Carson, who is the CEO of the Silicon Valley um, Community Foundation, um, who is an African American, you know, try her, try her best to do that, and you know, perhaps get him to provide some advice and guidance. Not that the community found. I'm not suggesting that they're going to, you know, give them money, but just as a person to talk to in the space, who is a leader, who is well respected, who is also African American, um, to reach out to her, if, you know, if he can. If she cannot, I'm happy to make an electronic um, introduction. And I would, this is Bricks and Diamond again. I would say it's important to, to, to organize. Uh, so we talked about Selma a bit. And so, you know, there have been a number of articles about, um, you know, groups of folks who work in the industry coming together. And I think it's important to create as many of those groups as possible and then to reach back from wherever in the world you came from, right? And so it's the same thing as a giving circle. I think about uh, the fact that I am more willing to move somewhere because my classmates from college are there or my contemporaries are there or there is some sense of a community. And so I think there, there, there are two efforts there. So, so one is creating more of a community, which I think will be helpful for everyone there to survive and to thrive. Uh, but then to reach back and to recruit others who will require that community. And so, you know, I'm also a member of the LGBT community. And the, uh, the chief information officer of Nike recently quit his job because he said he couldn't stay in Portland because it just wasn't a vibrant enough community for him. So if, you know, if people are quitting jobs at that level because it's not a vibrant community, when you're still in a very um, transition-filled stage of your life, it's important that, that, that it comes to be. And quite honestly, the, the companies in Silicon Valley aren't creating that for us. So I think I would call on you all as millennials in the space to create it for each other and then to spread the word that it's there and get other folks who are, you know, qualified as such a loaded term, uh, but I think who are interested and who are going to light up around the experience uh, out there and in the companies is an important, important next move. Absolutely. Great point. Um, and I'll say, too, for the person that asked that question, there are some other resources and contacts um, and just to Angela suggested that we at Apti can offer suggest. I know one of the people that are on the call actually, uh, I believe on the call is Summer Jackson who is the lead um, person for Bay Area Blacks of Philanthropy, which is a diverse network of folks there. There are about twelve of them around the country and they're they're a loose group of, of affinity organizations in that represent either states or regions or cities that are professionals that are in the field. So there are some other resources that are connected to AFI that we can also plug into. And those that we don't know of, we also are always open to learn more about what else is out there. There may be some that just, we just don't know about. And as, since Ferguson, there's been a lot of new groups that are emerging. 
where people are really coming to say, saying, we need to figure out how we're going to mobilize. So the idea of mobilization and engagement is important. And I think, too, to Angela's point around the notion of it being very important to be in all these spaces to help influence change is another important space. So after reading Veritun the Thurston's uh, book, um, you know, How to Be Black, you know, you can be that black friend in the space where there's not a lot of us occupying the space, but it also becomes a very influential place to be when used, when used and used widely. Uh, next question. Okay, the next question, um, the next asker um, posed, how do we convince those who believe that they have a low income to give. Many people think they don't have the funds uh, available to give to charity. You said anyone can be a philanthropist, but is there really a minimum to how much a philanthropist gives? If you give $10 a month to something, can you qualify yourself as a philanthropist and make a real difference? Guys, this is Charles again. I, I, I will just jump in if, if, if you don't mind um, you know one of the, you know one of the things I think in starting giving circles and I think it was talked about a little earlier you know at the end of the day um, you know many community foundations like the uh, community foundation there in the uh, national capital so with uh, Angela you know there is a minimum to start a fund and so that's ten thousand dollars so at the, at the time you know most of the folks that in, in, the, in our giving circle, and I've seen other giving circles start this way, you know, most of the folks that were sitting around the table didn't have $10,000 to start a fund. And so that was another reason why you pool your collective resources together because, you know, we had 21 individuals and folks basically did have enough money to divvy out that much to start a fund. Um, but at the end of the day, we all give to – you know, I, I personally, I, I believe philanthropists are folks who actually give to, uh, you know, buy Girl Scout cookies or help out in, in raffles for whatever good cause there is or United Way, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, we, we just have tried to be a little bit more uh, strategic um, as opposed to benevolent in our giving just because we were exposed to something different. But at the end of the day, it's about starting where you are. If that's ten dollars a month, you start at ten dollars a month because at some point, I believe, you know, for those believers, you know, the Bible says it's not necessarily what you see now; it is it is what God has in store for you. And I tend to believe God has a lot more in store for believers going forward. I would also add that I believe you can be a philanthropist by giving what is what is significant to you. Um, I did a session for a group of third graders at, at a DC public school and um, you know and we pulled all the money from that particular class and they gave to a charity of their course because the whole conversation was about anybody could be a philanthropist and some of them had a penny and some of them had you know a dollar and some of them had five dollars that they had gotten from their bank or whatever but just to say that the conversation can start as little as what's significant to you. Um, and I, I don't think there's a dollar value on it because it really is about what is significant to you that you are willing to give to have that impact. Just to round out, so I run a couple of foundations, and if you got $10 a month, I'll take it. Yep. Hi, this is Julie, so just chiming in um, to give the millennial perspective because a lot of us do feel like we don't have a lot of money, and I think it's important to, to push yourself to give, so one way I give is to give out of a, pay check, a payroll deduction so that you never see that money in the first place. So it seems like it's just like a tax or a bill that's already out of your pocket, so you don't even have to think about it after that. So I would encourage other people to find ways to give that donation first and think of it as something that's already an outlay or a bill, so it's not feeling like something extra that you're doing on top of your other things. Absolutely. Uh all great comments. And for those of us that may have forgotten, if you think about what was going on during the first campaign uh, during the Obama administration, these folks were asking for $5. $5. And the power of those small gifts put, some, put someone new in the White House that we probably had never expected to see. So uh, every bit counts. And, and as Kristen just said, I mean, there's a, plenty of nonprofits that would welcome a $5 a month gift 
from any of us. So it is worth, um, your giving is worth it. Our next question, we have time for maybe two more. That's perfect at work because we just have two left. Uh, the first question <laughs> is, across industries that have historically lacked diversity in, at the mainstream level, um, using referencing environmental and tech industries as examples, where are the where is this data being populated around diversity in these fields, and is this information readily available? Yeah, so this is Bricks and Diamond again. Um, so it, you know, I think that you see what it took in the tech industry to get that information published. Uh, it it takes campaigns and pressure. Uh, so it is not industry-wide in a place that I understand. I mean, there's some spaces, tech, entertainment, uh, financial services to some degree, but like the environmental space, which is, as an industry, relatively new. Um, there are folks who have been doing things you know, around clean energy for a little while, but I, I don't think that, that there are big bodies of research. The only place I would suspect they would exist are uh, in some of the federal documents that are required for grants and funding. Um, but I can only speculate on that. But you know, to the degree that the uh, EEOC requires them to meet some basic levels before giving them funding, that may be able to be consolidated into some insight. But I don't think that anybody's. I don't think Jesse and Reverend Al have gone out quite yet to the to the windmill, uh, the um, windmill uh, farms, and made them report those numbers just yet. Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the resources for that too tends to be. Uh, Foundation Center does pull that information together. Actually, AFI is looking to do some data collection on those, on that information as well. And Community Investment Network, which was mentioned a little bit ago, is starting to look at some of that kind of data. Uh, what what happens often is, and if you think about the idea of giving and, and giving, excuse me, by giving, what doesn't get counted usually in the philanthropic space is the charitable dollars that are given to faith to our faith. Place, which is one of the largest places that we give as a people. Um, Angela mentioned uh, some of that earlier. And so there's still more work to be done and being uh, more intentional around collecting data, but some people are starting to want to quantify what that looks like and where it's going. And some of it's been uh, it's emerging from that as people are asking those questions, just as this whole issue around my brother's keeper and black male achievement and such has gained a lot of prominence in the giving space people were still trying to go back and starting to go and say, well, how are people giving? And it's only what you report that demonstrates how it can be collected. So if the information is not uh, drilled down to that level as far as being provided, then when it's submitted, then it's hard to gather it. But these kinds of questions help help motivate and, and inspire people to start asking the right questions. And speaking of questions, we have one more, Bianca. We do, Edward. The last question is for Brixton. Um, does your organization value donations and gifts from CEOs personally or the organizations they represent? Specifically, does your organization mind if a company buys a table at 50000 and personally supports a scholarship fund, say, for a lesser amount, 10000 Uh So we are pretty um, non-discriminating. <laughs> Uh, so we, we want it from every source. So, you know, in my professional day job, most of our contributions come from corporations. Uh, and so that is the, the lion's share uh, uh, in our model. Uh, but I've sat on the boards of organizations that really rely more on individual donors. So I think it varies from organization to organization. Uh, you know, to answer that question, I think that people in the corporate space, you know, are able to, uh, gain a fair amount of, of juice by being able to influence the gifts of their organizations, right? But I think that the challenge is, and this is a, a, a little more nuanced, you know, I worked for a company in my asset management career that was very generous philanthropically. Um, but when I left there, if I had not been giving on my own, when I left their brand, that reputation uh, and that access would have been gone with me. Uh, and so, for example, uh, my old company gave a very uh, large gift uh, to Harvard Business School. And one of our division heads, who I happen to be close to, who also went to the same school, you know, when I asked him if he was giving personally, he said, no, I just give to the company fund. 
So he added his money to what the company was giving. Well, when he got fired, uh, he wasn't getting the credit. And so I think that is something to think about in terms of, you know, less what the what the the target organization wants, but more about what the objectives are of the of the donor. Hmm. Thank you, thank you for that, Brickson. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Well, specifically, Brickson, but does anyone have a perspective they want to share on that topic? Well, thank you all. Um, this has been a very informative conversation. I hope everyone that was able to dial in today had a chance to come away with some feedback and some insight around how they could uh, be more impactful and how they can really leverage who they are at whatever age in their space, in the space of philanthropy, and how you know, the most important part of this is really how we show up and the importance of our showing up. Uh, we're seeing so much going on of late, some of the work that AFI is involved in uh, with others around the country is really around how are we supporting organizing, for example, black organizing specifically, um, particularly as we're seeing the issues that are going around with, you know, with that's happened in Ferguson and Staten Island, and you know we, we just keep naming the places that where these areas of injustice are happening. Injustice keeps happening. Part of that leads to the work around policy engagement. It is it's addressed through what are the folks that are on the ground doing work. And so all that is part of the giving, how we're giving back our time, talent, and treasure, as has been illustrated by um, these great um, four great panelists. So there's some new opportunities for us to continue how we can improve the work. We want to continue the conversation. We want to make sure that you all are engaged, engaged and we also want to hear from you. So again, reach out to us, connect with us at AFI, tell us how you are giving. Write that letter. What is that dear philanthropy message in, in 140 characters or less that you would want philanthropy to start thinking about as it's doing its work? And, and tell us about it. Reach out to us um, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and again, this dear philanthropy hashtag. We're likely going to have another Third Thursday uh, webinar next month. Hopefully you'll join us for that one. But I want to thank all the panelists on behalf of AFI um, for your participation in this. And everyone stay tuned and look to receive a uh, survey from us as well as some other information around resources that have emerged from this conversation. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.